two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's lightning talks at Transform 2021. I'm delighted to be back hosting them after last year. We've got a great lineup today and tomorrow. There are still slots available if you would like to sign up. It can be on anything that you see fit to share with the community. To kick things off today, I've got Rob waiting in the wings, who I'm going to ask three questions, and then it will be his opportunity to talk for five minutes. If you have questions, please ask them in the T21 general channel or the general channel, or grab our speakers afterwards in the chateau. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to discuss with people. Anyway, Rob, the first question I'm going to ask you is, how long have you been with the software underground? Uh, right. Well, I had to look this up in the analytics tab. Um, I've been with the uh, Swung for about four years, just over four years, since February 2017. Mm -hmm. And what have you been working on lately, or what's been exciting you in the world of the software underground? So there's three main things. Uh, one of them is obviously work-related. We're preparing a new geology class or geology focus class with Martin, so that's taking some time, and I'm loving that. I'm also trying to work on Welly to make some uh, automated composite logs. And then there's the thing I'm going to talk to you about just in a few minutes. So, Great. And the final icebreaker question, what is one random fact that the software underground might not know? It can be about you, it can be about life, it can be about the universe. <laughs> um, I don't know. I speak some Swiss German. Not everyone knows that, I suppose. <laughs> That's a random factoid. <laughs> Great. So with that, Rob, the virtual floor is yours. If you'd like to start sharing your screen, you'll have five minutes, which will bring us up to just before the uh, the hour. And I will speak to you afterwards. All right. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, so here we go. Wellpath Pi in 300 seconds. So Wellpath Pi is a light package that Jürgen and I have been working on designed to load, load well deviations and handle them. I say it's a light package, it only requires NumPy. And right now, as you see, it's available on the PyPI um, in a state in a release 0.4, which means that potentially we might still break a few things. Jürgen and I are the main contributors, but initially we got help from Brendan Hall and Joe Walsh. Um, and when I say initially, well, this will look familiar to some of you. Well, PathPy was born at Transform 2019. And as you see on this photograph here, it was meant to sit between Welly, which everyone knows and loves, and a yet to be written fracture analysis library, let's say. Now, since Transform 2019, of course, I've met Irene, and so her frac toolbox might actually fill that spot. Now, WellPathPy is designed to handle a single deviation. It's not interested in handling projects like Welly does for last files, for instance. Neither do we plan to, to include anything to do with well planning or anti-collision work. If you're interested in that, I wholeheartedly recommend the work by Johnny Corcutt, so Johnny Maserati on GitHub and his WellEng library. But back to WellPathPy, how do we use it? So we like to import it as WP. And once you've imported your CSV um, deviation file, you'll get back the first object, a deviation, which is essentially a glorified triple of MD inclination azimuth. Now, this deviation has got some methods attached to it, as you see here after the step and depths line. And so from that, you can compute a position object, which is the computed position of the well path. Now, this position has got no memory of the method that created it, but it does know what deviation it came from. And as you can see, we can go back to a deviation from that positional log. Now, you'll also notice here we've got a resample method, which right now is only available on the minimum curvature method. And the reason we coded this up is, as I said, initially, this was going to sit between Welly and a fracture analysis um, package, let's say. And I wanted to be able to get fracture intensities per meter. Now, measured depths are never measured um, at regular intervals. And so what I wanted was to be able to get back a regularly uh, sampled trajectory. So this is what this looks like. We're looking at a deviated well here. On the left, it's the whole well. On the right, it's uh, the build section. And in blue, you see the raw positional log, which is irregularly sampled. And then in orange, you see the regularly sampled trajectory, which matches our input. So what methods are available to you in WellPathPy? 
Um, before I go through this, let me just say that WellPathPy is by design unit and coordinate, coordinate reference system unaware. Um, we leave that to the client. So for example, Welly handles coordinate reference systems and therefore we do not. Um, so we're dealing with grid northing and easting. So the method that you're gonna use nine times out of 10 or more is minimum curvature. And that will return to you uh, TVD, northing, easting, and dog leg severity. We also provide you with some comparison methods. So the radius of curvature and the various tan methods. But again, this is really just for comparison and in general, you won't be using them. So what does this look like? We now look at a horizontal well. Um, so we've got a view from the south on the left, a view from the east on the right, and then the zoomed in version, uh, zoomed in section at the bottom. In red, you see the minimum curvature, which we can think of as the, the base case, uh, of course, with its own uncertainty. And then you see um, above and below it, the other uh, methods and their relative uncertainty uh, relative to that. So where from with this? Well, we need a... I'm sorry, I'm here someone speaking, but I didn't hear what that was. So I'll just carry on in the last 40 seconds. So uh, we made a pull request 161 in Welly, and with that pull request, Welly learns to use WellPathPy to handle deviation data. And importantly, we were careful not to change the API of uh, Welly. So in Welly, WellPathPy aims to be to deviations what LASIO is to LAS files. And I was going to conclude there, but as you see, uh, this pull request was merged into the develop branch of Welly, so hopefully we'll see something there soon. And that's all I have for you. Um, thank you, Rob. You are perfectly on time. So please, any questions about this, do direct them to Rob directly. Uh, you, could pro you can definitely find more stuff about this everywhere. It's nice for me to see the whiteboard from the very first transform in the chateau <laughs> making an right, outing. Yeah. Um, with uh, Evan's diligent writing and the ideas of the, the the great and the good that are assembled there. So we are perfectly on time and we're now going to move to Matt Hall, who I think some people here might know, who was a last minute addition to the schedule with a lightning talk. How are you, Matt? Great. Yeah. How, yeah. how are you? I'm good. So I don't think we need to know how long you've been in the software underground because uh I think it's been certainly a little while. Um, I don't know if you have to put an estimate on it. Is it is it geological time yet, or are we still in the human time scale? Yeah, it was. I don't know. It was in the Anthropocene. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a long time ago. Another universe ago. Now, now having met so many people, it's great. So that's good. And I guess other than transform, what have you been working on? Uh, I know there's hundreds and thousands of uh, projects going on at the moment. So, yeah, I mean, trying to trying to uh, rekindle some um, action around uh, Welly and Striplog, which I think are both useful tools, and I still use them all the time, and we teach them in our classes. But they've um, there's there's some hard truths to face up to, especially in Welly. I think that needs some deep refactoring. So that's. Uh, that's the sort of stuff we've been discussing and and planning and getting ready for. So like WellPathPy now does the deviation, the D survey inside of Welly um, in the next release anyway, it's in dev right now. Um, you know, so that's the sort of thing I want to try and simplify so that Welly has less to do. <laughs> the less bugs I have to write, the better. Excellent. And your final question before the floor is yours is what's one random fact you want the software underground to know? I forgot you were going to ask that. Uh, um, I was going to slip in yet another thing about um, software underground, but but no, I I don't know. I, this is my current bedtime reading. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering how much of a nerd I actually am, uh, this is a great book, by the way. A hundred dollars well spent, or whatever it was. Mm. It sounds like it's less than a dollar a page uh, by the look of it, so definitely good value. <laughs> anyway, to, to, to keep things on schedule, Matt, the virtual yep. floor is yours for five minutes, at which point I shall reappear and uh, keep things rolling. So oh, yeah. Enjoy. Cool. Thank you. Uh, let me share this uh, then. Um, 
I, you know, I, I apologize for hijacking a lightning talk, but it, this is basically a uh, an advert for Software Underground Project. Um, I, you know, occasionally things come up in the channels and I'm like, uh, oh, right, not everybody knows about this thing. Uh, so I thought I'd try and mention uh, several of them at least, um, just to, so that we can, you know, spread the word, be aware, help each other find tools and solutions to problems uh, that are already out there. Um, so first one is this tool that we're using right now instead of Zoom, basically. This is Jitsi. Uh, this is actually um, Software Underground's own implement, or um, we're hosting it, basically, on AWS, uh, thanks to Filippo Brogini. So jitsi.softwareunderground.org is a uh, you know place where you can come and host your own meeting, so please use it. If, uh, if you're looking for another platform, it's open source and it's awesome. Uh, it can also stream to YouTube. That's what we're doing. Software Underground has a YouTube channel. Um, you know, I absolutely would welcome and love to see uh, content from our members making it onto the channel, whether that's uh, having uh, special interest group meetups that you live stream. Uh, there are several of us now that know how to do the live streaming thing. It's dead easy uh, from Jitsi. And we, we've used other tools as well. Uh, so we can totally help get you set up like that. If you dream of being a, uh, you know, a YouTuber, um, then by all means, use the Software Underground platform. We have um, uh, th close to 1,300 subscribers, so it can, can maybe give you a boost for your uh, early content before you get your your first million and you're off on your own. Um, you know that platform is is belongs to the membership. There's also you may have seen um, this funky Gather space. Um, Gather Town is a new um, sort of proximal or proximity based chat application. Um, it works on desktop, works on mobile, works in the web browser. And uh, if you've not been into the Chateau yet, go, do go and check it out. Um, it's the short link, uh, swu.ng slash Chateau. And um, check it out. Have a wander around, meet new people. We're trying to get some of that serendipity of conferences back. That reminds me of the link shortener. Uh, if you don't know about it, you can go to the Slack bot or indeed anywhere in Software Underground and uh, just type a forward slash and then um, shorten. So slash shorten and the little helper will pop up. Basically, you can give it a link to shorten and it will shorten it for you with the Software Underground um, link shortener. You know. If you're doing stuff about Software Underground, then it makes a lot of sense, right? If you've got uh, links that you want to share with people and they might have to write them down or type them in. You're, it's built into Slack, so uh, use it um, as you wish. Next thing, Filippo is... Uh, <laughs> I just checked with him that it was okay for me to mention this, and he said it was, so I'm going to. Uh, there is shortly going to be a um, Jupyter Hub that we are hosting. Um, so it'll be probably jupiter.softwareunderground.org. Right now it's on jupiter-dev.softwareunderground.org. You can sign in with your Slack credentials. So basically it's there for only uh, users of uh, like swung um, slackers to use. And it's gonna be a place for you to host um, notebooks and things that will you know, run in the browser for people. So if you're doing tutorials or courses, uh, maybe that's a cool option for you. Feedback to the board, um, Filippo, um, I guess if, if you're interested in communicating about Swung stuff in Slack, the best place to go is the Swung-org channel. That, <laughs> I, I may have to be flagged down because my the, my phone has gone uh, gone black, so I don't actually know <laughs> what my time is. Uh, so I'm just gonna, just gonna carry on until Dan interrupts me. Um, Dataunderground.org is um, a, an instance of a CCAN. CCAN is the sort of standard open data hosting platform. Uh, we have an instance of it running right here. You can search for things like uh, the Groningen um, data set. We've got this open fork, for example, of Groningen. Here's a description. Here's a CSV file in that data set. Uh, data Underground can like preview CSVs. And the cool thing about the CCAN, this, uh, platform is it's got a full API already there. People can query this uh, programmatically. They can download data programmatically. Um, it's not actually hosting most of the data. It's just pointing at things. But we do host a little bit of stuff on our S3. 
So Software on Ground has an S3 and a whole AWS platform. If you want um, to host files, use compute and so on, reach out to Filippo or me or Steve Purvis in swung-org. Yeah, and I think that's perfect, Matt. You're uh, at five minutes exactly. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I will uh, back to your normal programming. <laughs> Yeah. Um, thanks to Matt for stepping in at the last minute to fill uh, fill that gap with some great. I mean, there's things here I didn't know that were going on, so uh, real yeah. nice to to nice to see. Uh, our next speaker, according to my schedule, is Olawe. So if you want to come off mute and and share your camera for the pre chat, then uh, we can keep things moving. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Good day, Hi. everyone. Good, good afternoon. How are you today? Are you excited to yeah. Uh, present? Yeah, good afternoon. Okay, cool. So I'll start with the same question I've asked everyone is how long have you been involved with the software underground? Um, okay, um, I joined Software Underground. That was that was last year uh, during the first competition, the first machine learning competition. And I wasn't really I wasn't really active then, but became fully active um, in January this year. And I've been interacting and um, collaborating with some members of, of Swung since then. And it's been interesting. It's been a great one. Great. Uh, what are you currently working on at the moment? What's got you excited uh, in the world of Software Underground at the moment? Um, OK. Uh, actually, um, at the moment, I'm working on my final year, final year's um, project. That's an undergraduate project. So I'm, I'm I'm trying to use um, unsupervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning to classify to classify seismic fishes. So we are I'm currently using a um, yeah um, state of the art um, model, unsupervised model, and trying to use it with um, seism on seismic data. But there hasn't been um, great um, promising results yet. But hopefully I'll be able to yeah get interesting results out of it. So. That, that's really cool. I, I've always liked unsupervised learning myself, but I've never okay. tried it on seismic. I've done a lot of wells and cutting kind of stuff with it. And then finally, before I hand the floor over to you, uh, what's one random fact you want the software underground to know? It can be about anything in the in the world. Um, okay, I was actually thinking about that, and I was just I was just going to talk about about myself actually. So, um, okay, I, I I was going to share that I didn't. I didn't choose set out to study applied geophysics in the first place. Initially, my interest was in was in computer science and yeah, in computer science. But when I got admission from my university, I wasn't I wasn't offered computer science but applied geophysics. So since then I so and not wanted to wait a, a full year before I before I get into the university. So I, I took up the offer. And since then it's been it's been nice and yeah, I fell in love with applied geophysics actually. So that's so that's just it. Awesome. Well, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. So if you want to start sharing your screen, I will talk to you afterwards. All right. So I'm going to share my screen now. All right. Oh, okay. Today I'll just be talking about I'll be talking about Zindi, which is which is a data science organization. So just like just like we have it for cargo that connects um, data scientists all over the world, so we also have Omzindi, um, which is which is a, uh, an organization that connects African data scientists together to work and to find um, solutions to find solutions to um, in, to problems using AI, machine learning, and data and data science. So the way they um, work is that um, they get okay they get contacted by organizations that is organizations looking for. AI or machine learning solutions to to, the, to any problem they are facing, and then they contact um, Zindi, and then they host a kind of competition where data scientists all over Africa can can work on the problem and try to get find AI or machine learning solutions to the problem, and then winners get um, rewarded based on um, fixed price at set out at the beginning of the competition. So the way it works is um, they organize competition, actual competitions. Oops. They organize actual competitions, and that is competitions taking about two, more than like um, spanning two months or so, and also hackathons, which are just short um short um period um like competitions also. 
So the way, um, okay, so and one interesting thing about um, Zing is that it's a great platform. Say, for example, you're, you're a beginner starting in, starting in data science or machine learning. It's a great platform where you can learn a lot of things because from competitions, there are discussion pages where, um, where data scientists like yourself, beginners or experts, where they share, um, where they share knowledge and they share ideas and uh, their solutions to what they are working on. And at the end of the competitions or hackathons, they also, they, they also share their um, notebooks, which you could take take a look at and learn on um, interesting data science or machine learning machine learning techniques. So apart from hosting competitions, they also there's also um, there's also a platform for learning where they have articles relating to machine learning, how to how to write on better programs, machine learning programs, and things yeah and things like that. So so it's a great platform for learning actually, and also um. They also have um, this um, feature whereby you can, as organizations, you can find um, you can find data science talent that is in Africa. Maybe you want them to work with you or help them with a particular problem which you need um, AI to solve for you. And also, as data scientists or maybe um, enthusiasts or beginners, if you're looking for, if you're hoping to get a job, you could you get um, con contacted by yeah by Zindi, depending on how um, how depending on how good you are you can get contacted by them i have a friend that um yeah that's recently got a job with a um, financial institution here in africa exc massad and so yeah so that's so that's just so that's just yeah. okay and apart from that they also organize okay they have closed and open competitions so the open competitions is open for is open to for everyone to join for everyone to join why the close competition? You say, for example, your school is trying to organize a close competition for for students, or maybe um maybe we have competitions for female data scientists and things like that. So the close competition is kind of restricted to some particular community or groups. Oops. And also, why the open competition is open is open to all. So in short, it's a great platform. Just just like um we have for cargo, but in this case, um more. Like more, more for um data science on um, African data scientists. So a great platform for learning, and also for getting yeah, for getting jobs and solving AI problems and um, solving problems using AI and artificial intelligence. And I myself, I, I yeah, I was actually very addicted to taking um competitions on Zindi, and I learned a lot. Of, I learned a lot from Zindi, like that's from competing. On competing in competitions and things like that, so it greatly improved my my data science and machine learning um, skills. So yeah, I recommend it for anyone looking to looking to improve their machine learning um, skills and getting started in data science. So um, so yeah, that's all from me. If anyone has any question or about that, I'll I'll be glad to take it in the Slack channel or right now. So yeah. so I'll stop sharing now. Great. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. It, it's one of the great things about Transform is seeing these local initiatives and uh, and well done for being the first speaker who was uh, under time by 30 seconds. So <laughs> we've had an extra 30 seconds. But yeah, please do uh, find out more. You know, I remember last year we had the Geo Latinas uh, plug in, in, the, in the Lightning Talks and I know we're very keen for global stuff. So, but thank you so much for taking five minutes out of your day to share that with the community. We uh, so next next up will be Artash returning from last year, uh, marking one of our returning speakers, and then we'll go into a quick break afterwards. Uh, sporting a software underground T-shirt, I see this year. Yeah, I see this year. Yeah. Uh, got got a bit of an echo here. I'm not sure if that's on your end or your end or. Okay. Um, I can try switching mics if that works. Yeah. Is this any better? Let's see. Yeah, that seems to have fixed it slightly. Or right. I can I can just or stop I'm talking just and we can move to you move straight into your presentation if you're ready. Presentation. All right then. Uh, is this work then? 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I was st I'm still getting no, the echo. I was st I'm still getting the echo. But I think I think it's no, okay. I think it's okay. I think if uh, I think we, if, go, uh, we go, go straight into live presentation, into live presentation with you, then, uh, with you, then uh, make things yeah, easier. Make things easier. So if you want to share your screen so and present, you and I'll catch you at the end. And I'll catch you at the end. All right then. Yeah, I can go right into my project. Let me just share my screen. All right then, uh, thanks. It's great to be back at the Seismic Underground Hackathon uh, for 2021. I was here last year as well. And in fact, attending the Transform 2020 Hackathon was what first got me interested in seismology because before last year, I had no idea uh, what was seismology or how to work with seismic data. But after last year and after attending the hackathon, this sparked my interest into seismology. And in the past year, I've been working on several projects, including one uh, pretty big project about seismology, which I'm going to be giving a quick rundown about today. So in last year's hackathon was in the midst of the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So everything was uh, pretty weird, as you could say. Uh, my school was online. Everything was really different. Going outside, I had to wear a mask. and. After I joined the seismic community of Transform, I wanted to experiment around with seismic data as well. And I realized that after the pandemic, a common approach to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic had been the COVID-19 lockdowns, which meant shutting down travel, businesses, and stopping people from going outside so much. And I wondered, how would this large stoppage in human movement affect seismic vibrations? Because activities like cars, streetcars, transport, all affect seismic vibrations. So I was wondering how much would seismic vibrations have really decreased during these lockdowns? So since I had no idea how seismology worked, I was able to post queries on to the software underground Slack community. And I was able to learn a lot about different libraries, including OpSpy, that are used to process seismic data. So I was immediately able to download seismic data for several 13 Canadian cities using the OpSpy library with data from the Canada's seismograph network. After downloading this data, I learned a lot about the analysis behind seismic data. The analysis that I used in this case was pretty interesting. Because I wanted to understand the change in seismic vibrations caused by human movements, I worked with OpSpy, which has a power spectral density function, which means splitting data into its individual frequencies. Interestingly, human-caused vibrations happen at a higher frequency of 4 to 20 hertz, while natural-caused vibrations, such as ones by earthquakes, happen at a lower frequency of 0 to 2 hertz. So in my analysis, I was able to split the data based on frequency and extract the seismic vibrations caused by human movements in the 4 to 20 hertz band. And my results were really interesting. I plotted the data for six of my cities here, Montreal, Calgary, Ottawa, Whitehorse, Halifax, and Toronto. And I was able to measure a decrease between 12 to 55% in all the cities of my study. And it's really clear that during this red zone, which signifies a lockdown between the end of March and to May, the seismic vibrations have dipped pretty significantly. What more, I also decided to look at the change in seismic vibrations between day and nighttime to verify and to look for sources of seismic vibrations. And during the weekend, seismic vibrations were around 40% lower than weekdays. And I've been working on being able to extract the sources of seismic vibrations so that using seismic vibrations, I can track what are the levels of car traffic or subway traffic or street traffic based on what frequencies decrease on the weekends. I also made all my code available on my GitHub, uh, and I've been expanding this project to other countries as well. So uh, for example, I've expanded to Spain, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Poland so far. And it's not stopped there either. So that anyone can look at the analysis I've done for seismic vibration data, 
I created a website, monitormylockdown.com. And this website allows you to look at the changes in human caused seismic vibrations for any of the Canadian cities in my study. So here on the left, you can pick a city, for example, Ottawa, the capital of Canada. The first thing it'll tell you is the current level of seismic vibrations. So here it says that seismic vibrations have decreased by 15% right now in Ottawa since the first lockdown. Then it's able to tell you the changes between weekends and weekday seismic vibrations on the right. So here, for example, if I look at the past three months, it's pretty obvious that seismic vibrations are much lower on weekends in which is shaded in green. And finally, to help track the source of these seismic vibrations, it even offers a feature for frequency. So you can observe the change in seismic vibrations for different frequencies. Like in 5 to 10 hertz, it shows that the decrease during the first lockdown was only by 13% in terms of seismic vibrations. But in the 15 to 20 hertz frequency band, it decreases by almost 60%, which is decreasing by almost three times more than in the 5 to 10 hertz band. So now I've been working more on using ocean data as well, because this decade was in fact declared the decade of oceanics by different organizations. So I've been working on replicating the same results that I did for ocean data as well. And I hope to be able to share my results uh, from analyzing the ocean data as well at a future Transform Hackathon. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, please join us after the break for a uh, for uh, the continuation of the talks. We'll be back on the hour, and there will be uh, plenty of time to talk to the, this morning's present this afternoon, this morning, this evening's wherever you are in the world presenters uh, in the in the, in the chateau and the T twenty one general chat. All right. Well, to inter to interrupt the little break, Matt, I think it, we've got a bit of a surprise yeah. well. discussion for those, <laughs> those who are still with us. Uh, yeah, we decided that maybe uh, with the break, was having so much dead air wasn't uh, wasn't applicable. So yeah, computational field camp, uh, an idea that came out of the first transform, I guess. Uh, yeah, I actually can't remember when it first, um, when we first started talking about it, it was on, I made a software underground. So I made something in the GitHub repo. There's a, I'm just looking It's way back. Oh, there's a, there's a repo software underground. Um, so github.com software underground event proposals. There's a repo there for like capturing, um, event proposals, I guess uh, that we had a couple at the time. So this was, yeah, this was May 2019. So that was, uh, that was the first transform. And the idea was to do a, a hackathon basically, but outside. So a hackathon in the field um, with laptops and hackers and drones and geologists, field geologists um, stumbling around in the field together, maybe some of the hackers learning how to do data capture with handheld gamma ray and uh, other field instruments, seismometers, um, LIDAR, drones, uh, etc. And um, maybe hacking on some open software projects, but also some software, uh, sorry, some open hardware projects, um, perhaps, you know, tinkering with uh, soldering irons and components and uh, whatnot, 
uh, building fit for purpose, but affordable field instruments. Um, Because we did some uh, Googling around when we first had this uh, thought, and it it quickly became clear that a lot of handheld field instruments are really, really expensive. (laughs) So, you know, like $15,000 kind of thing for a a handheld gamma ray. Um, And that just seemed bonkers because it seemed to me like you could buy the components on Adafruit for, you know, 20 bucks. So... There's, you can, I mean, that document is a bit out of date, but I think many of the people who've been chatting about this, um, this idea since then are on there. So Brian Burnham and uh, you, Dan, uh, were two of the sort of proper geologists that were, were interested in making something like that happen. And then um, a couple of hardware-focused people, um, including John Lehman, were in into the idea of um, putting together a kit so that a person in the field could um, build something interesting or a group in the field, I should say, could build something interesting. And maybe even, you know, trying to make that kit like open specs. Maybe you could even purchase it on the softwareunderground.org website. Um, you know, we could even donate some to uh, universities and other groups around uh, around the world wanting to take part in our hackathon or do something on their own. So, um, yeah, we put some f- sort of um, questions out to say, where could we do something like this? And, uh, you know, who would be interested and what kind of things could we do with laptops and drones and uh, and so on? And... We sort of settled on um, Ainza in the Spanish Pyrenees as a location because several of us know the area, although I haven't been there for donkey's years. Um, it's got plenty of existing data collected from the subsurface and from the f- sort of surface geology, the field. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's a lovely, it's a lovely place. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful part of the Pyrenean foothills. And, um, but then I guess since COVID, we've been thinking, okay, maybe we need a, 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 to sort of um, decentralize the idea a little bit and have, maybe there's a team in Utah and another team in, um, I don't know, scattered all over the place, you know, wherever, uh, basically, where you can get kind of two or three or more enthusiasts together to, to form a hackathon team. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. We got a generous donation of five thousand US dollars from Dell Technologies last year, which was awesome of them because we had no idea. So this two years ago, I think. Um, yeah, it was probably at the end of twenty nineteen that we got that donation, uh, which was pretty cool because you know we had no idea really what it was. It was a very thin sketch at, the, at that point, um, and and sort of still is because it completely got derailed last year. So. Um, so it's back on the cards, probably not for this year, but, but but maybe next year when people can move around a bit. And yeah, if you're into the idea and you'd like to be involved and maybe do something locally um, where you are or, or something in Einzer, if we actually do manage to get a team to Einzer, uh, then to get, like, get stuck in. The field camp, um, field dash camp is the name of the channel in Slack. Uh, where you want to um, get in there and you know put your hand up, and especially I would say if you're into hardware s- s- hacking, you know building, making uh, with electronics and so on, because there aren't that many of us who are into that side of things. Um, but I f- I feel like it would be really cool if that was a strong feature of the event. Yeah. I think the big, big push for us was to get a lot of the non-geos on Swan, because we know there's a lot of you who don't come from uh, the field geology background, to get you out there and kind of making, you know, trying some field work, putting a hard hat on and making our lives better as well with uh, tools and things we wouldn't think to do. Because, you know, we, we go out there, we swing a hammer, we measure rocks with a compass, we write down in a, in a yellow notebook that's weatherproof. That hasn't changed probably for a couple of hundred years at least. <laughs> the core the core core tenets of geology are there and then you'll enter into a computer so 
Yeah. You know, I remember the original pitch, uh, Soapbox pitch was we collect data, we collect data by day and we code it up by night and there's beer everywhere. That was that was how I always imagined it. it was going up the mountain, get the data, at the base is some supercomputer we put it into. Yeah. And we go back up the mountain, do it again. So And this is it's mainly a ploy to get uh Jurgen Kvalsvik into the field um with, with with a hammer and a chisel and um and a and a handheld gamma ray tool measuring data yeah. on the spanish outcrop i just think i just think he'd have a blast um yeah. <laughs> i mean you've been, I know called out. you've been called out you've been called <laughs> out. um but yeah the, like part of the original motivation was an experience i had going into the field um you know because like i did my share of field geology i guess uh, um as of um undergrad and postgrad and um and and then didn't do any for years after I sort of joined uh, the petroleum industry and, um, you know, maybe like here and there. Anyway, I went on one when we shale gas, you know, turned into a really big thing, obviously in the mid noughties kind of thing in Canada anyway. And, um, you know, I joined a shale exploration team for a little while or unconventional exploration as they called it. And we went off into the field and, um, and there were like 20 of us, but we were kind of just, it was that old experience of being dragged around from outcrop to outcrop on a bus and everybody crawling over these outcrops with the instructors being like, yeah, you know, I've been here 30 times before and I'll do my lecture and I'll draw that drawing I always draw on the whiteboard or on the side of the van or whatever. And, um, and some people are drawing and some people are making notes and some people are fiddling with their phones and, you know, uh, some people are just sort of soaking it all in and, and, uh, mucking about or whatever uh, so it was fun but I sort of felt like wow this was kind of kind of a missed opportunity we had 20 people at this outcrop for three hours I feel like if we'd had some instruments and there was a, a kind of a purpose then we could have collected some awesome data while we were here and then had all the conversations that come from that so um, I love the idea that people could if the instruments were inexpensive enough people going to these outcrops over and over again, just adding and adding to these data sets over the years. And eventually you've got these amazing, huge data sets um, that no one person could ever have gone and collected. It's way too much for one field season or whatever. Um, you know, so that, that, that was kind of the, the spark for me was like, how can we mobilize the, the, the global community of geoscientists that would love to spend more time outside and love to spend time doing data collection um, and have options for data collection um, where everything's already half digital um, and, and, you know, make that more accessible. And, uh, yeah. So, so the, the, you know, it's connected to that kind of um, bigger, bigger picture for me is all about d digitalizing geology a bit because it's still pretty common to see people, I mean, uh, um, you know, people will – the go-to application, for example, for quote unquote digitizing a field log, it would be like Illustrator or Corelldor to go and draw the log that's clearly wants to be data. Um, but uh, th those are the tools. So these are what I sort of think of as like pseudo digital representations of, of the earth um, in that they're digital and you can use them in a Word document or whatever, but you can't uh, measure things and do things with them in python say so anyway um yeah but like i say definitely need more hardware people uh hardware hackers if you really know a field area well and are familiar with the issues of getting people around in the field and um uh you know whether you can fly drones or not and arranging accommodation and all of those sort of logistical things that would also be an immensely um useful skill to bring to this uh, endeavor um and then if you've got ideas for sort of um especially r relevant scientific problems in a particular field area that because i you know i do feel like it's one thing to go into the field and hack around with drones and uh and whatnot it's another thing to go into the field with a scientific purpose and say okay we're going to try and contribute to the solution of this actual problem um that would be a pretty cool um yeah, I was going to say nice to have. Maybe, maybe it should be like a prerequisite, but uh, no, I feel that actually um, it's it, it, we may not be able to find 
that scientific problem the perfect problem but if you feel like you might know what that what that is then it would be amazing to hear from you on that um yeah um there was something i was going to say but i i honestly can't remember i had a had a really pertinent point about field camp and i lost it but well, uh, you know, th so um, again, this is uh, a, a sort of example of something that started off as a small idea. Software Underground has a little bit of legitimacy now, so it's relatively easy for us to go and find sponsorship for good ideas. Um, and, you know, Dell Technologies, uh, as they very often have been in the past, were very forthcoming with uh, some seed money for that. Um, and the organization has a bit of money of its own now too. So, I mean, it, you know, do think of uh, Software Underground when you're thinking about running events, or especially if you don't quite know what that event is. I think that's our kind of, that's our specialty is um, exploring ill-defined, um, ill-defined things that no one's really tried before. So yeah, to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, good. I think that brings us nicely uh, back around to the start of the afternoon or uh, second half of the lightning talks i realize not everyone is on oslo time such as myself where it's just coming up to 5 p.m um so with that um do check out the computational field camp channels uh there's lots of ideas about hardware distributed hacks and everything going on there and we'd really love to make it happen next year so our next speaker up is just check my list is sebastian so if you want to uh, come off mute share your camera and join us yeah good afternoon Hi. good morning good day um i'm not sure where in the world you are uh, in germany so we're on the same time zone excellent excellent yeah. and uh, how, how long have you been in the software underground oh that's that's a good question i just stumbled upon it because um, I found this uh, awesome list last year on GitHub, which was quite helpful for me. So there I just added uh, my my GitHub organization. And then I just found out this year that you're well organized. So I found your Slack channel and joined it. And yeah, we had a release of what I want to present now last week from JS Tools. And then I annoyed, annoyed everyone there because <laughs> I sent to everybody a notification. And yeah, afterwards, Matt said, you should have a lightning talk. And then I just got to know that there's this uh, um, conference here this week. Another thing I love. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Yeah. It's, uh... So I'm just diving into the uh, software underground. Great. Just uh, good. So Alessandro's just muted himself. Good. So yeah. So what are you working on at the moment, uh, other than your release? Um, you mean directly in JS tools or? At no, all? just generally. Well, what's exciting you? What's the buzz? You know, what's going? Well, what, what what's keeping you busy at the moment? A lot of stuff. So I'm working at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig in Germany, and I'm a model keeper there. I'm working on the mesoscale hydrological model as a model keeper, and we got some projects on for that. And beside that, I'm hardly trying to finish my PhD. And the last thing that's included in my PhD is JS tools that I want to present now. And I'm working on a GMD uh, paper for JS tools. And yeah, that's planned for the next month. So there's Great. a lot of work to do at the moment. <laughs> so what? Uh, so the final one is one random fact you want the software underground to know. It can be about anything, and then the floor is yours to present your lightning talk. Oh, one one random fact. Um, uh, when you're on Google and you type in "how do I convert to," you get some suggestions for autocomplete, and that is. Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, and PDF. And the founder of the latter one just passed away. So maybe I just want to say rest in peace, Charles Geschke at that point. And in case of PDF, I think we all agree that this one made the world better. Great. So if you'd <laughs> like to start sharing, and I will see you in five minutes. Yeah, I try to share the correct screen. So, okay, hope you're seeing it. Yeah, I have a 
small presentation you can also check out yourself later on on my github account and i got a presentation for transform 21. so chair tools uh, python toolbox for your geostatistical projects from me and my and some co-workers um okay i have to click again here okay gs tools as i just said is embedded in a github organization i found it uh, two years ago it's called geostat framework which is a framework for geostatistical simulation and applications there's also another tool in there called well test pi and ojs 5 pi for simulations so check it out i guess some of you are interested in but let's focus on gs tools here that's a geostatistical toolbox with a lot of uh, tools provided. So for example, simple and ordinary creaking, universal creaking, external drift creaking, detrended creaking. So all kinds of creaking, then random field generation, conditioned field generation. We provide all that in arbitrary dimensions and for geographical coordinates, we provide variogram estimation and fitting all in an automated ma manner. We provide directional variogram estimation and modeling, data normalization, transformation, a lot of covariance models you can use for all these routines. And we provide also some basic spatiotemporal modeling approaches and a lot of convenience functions, exporting routines and plotting stuff. So you can simply install it by pip and conda. Just type pip install gs tools or conda install gs tools in your environment and you will have it. We have pre-compiled binaries. And to not waste time, I just jump into it. So random field generation, that was the original main feature of that tool. Um, my background is that I started to work on pumping test analysis in heterogeneous media. And I needed a tool to generate synthetic aquifers to perform um, pumping tests on it to yeah check out my Ana ana analytic tools and that's why we needed a tool to generate easily generate fields so and this is a very simple um, script in that case so you set up a model in that case a Gaussian model in two dimensions with variance of one and a length scale of 10 then you set up your spatial random function and you just generate your field on a structured uh, structured field and afterwards you can plot it and as you see you get a smooth gaussian isotropic field um, in 2d with five lines of code and it can also be a bit fancier for example using the matern model with anisotropy and rotation there you just uh, add a list of length scales along the main axis and you provide a rotation angle 22 degree in that case and then you set it up again in the same in the same manner and as you see the field gets a bit more rough and rotated and anisotropic yeah that's really simple the next thing we provide is creaking we provide a lot of classes as i just said and we have a sim uh, swiss army knife for creaking i called it that way because you can perform every other method with it but there are some shortcuts we provide so simple creaking where you have to provide a, a mean or ordinary creaking where the mean is estimated or universal creaking where uh, functional drift is estimated along the creaking routine or external drift creaking where you have you have to provide the drift functions from an external source or detrended creaking which can be used for regression creaking there are it's not um, a bad thing if you can't figure out all these routines by yourself. There are a lot of examples in the uh, tutorials on our documentation. But to give an impression, um, here's a short example on interpolating uh, temperature station data from the German weather service uh, with lat long information for the stations and a temperature time series. And here we want to interpolate it on an output grid. Um, yeah. And again, you just need some lines of, of code where you again provide the model. And here we use a spherical model with a lat long support. And we want to rescale it to the earth radius to get a meaningful length scale. Then we set up the creaking routine. And we just state that the variogram should be fitted automatically to the given data. And then again, we just generate the fields 
uh, on the given structured grid. And afterwards, we get something like that. And to get information about uh, the model, you can just uh, print out the model information. And we see that the variance was estimated to be around 10. Length scale is about 470 kilometer. Nugget is almost zero. And rescale is uh, Earth radius in kilometer. Yeah, and combining random fields and Krigging, you can also uh, generate conditioned fields. Um, here, a simple example with five conditioning points, and you can generate an ensemble of conditioned fields um, to not only have the correct fields where you only get a mean, but in places of with no information, you can generate a random behavior for ensemble simulations later on. That's also a nice thing we used in the past. And a final thing I'd like to draw attention to is data normalization that uh, can be used for something like uh, transmissivity or conductivity in subsurface science for where you uh, treat them as log normal distributed or precipitation data that is often transformed with Box-Cox transformation. And to give a short impression on how that looks like, I generated a synthetic log normal field, just as I presented with uh, the random field generator. And then we are taking samples from this field. And afterwards, we want to reconstruct the field from the samples. And the data normalization and the variogram should be fitted automatically. And that can be done with these lines of code. So again, we use Krigging. And we want the normalizer that is given as, as the Box-Cox normalizer. And the variogram should be fitted automatically. And we can then have a look on how they were estimated. And we see Box-Cox transformation has a parameter of 0, which corresponds to a log normal field. And data normalization then um, came from this histogram to this histogram. So you see the data really got normal with that. And we then can, again, generate the fields. And here we see that the original field that was sampled from in the center was reconstructed quite well with just these methods that do all for you. So that's a nice thing. I'm, a, I'm afraid you're okay. uh, out of, you're out that's of time. Well, that's, that's good. That's no, it. thanks. There's some great comments in the uh, Slack channel about about this so i think you're gonna have a lot of questions uh, one of which is are we going a tutorial at t22 next year yeah on, i hope so uh, GS tools so great if there's uh, interest yeah have a look at the I think there is um, yeah but thanks for presenting and sharing it and i'm glad you welcome to the software underground yeah thank um, you Cool. if you want to stop sharing we're going to move swiftly on to a man who was presenting last year uh from the other side of the world to me uh martin do you want to step up to the plate? Yeah, I, I can step up. Hello. Last, last year, it was the book you were working on. Um, uh, was it of the open source geology of South Africa? I yeah, don't know something like that. Uh, if you're yeah. going to present similar. but No, well, maybe. Anyway, uh, so if we rattle through the uh, warm up questions, and then yeah. you can dive right in. How long have you been in the software underground? Um, uh, Steve shared a link to the Google group, and it turns out that I joined that in August of 2014. So um, I must have joined Swung shortly after that, uh, the, the Slack at least, um, when it, or fairly shortly after it first became a thing, I guess. So, cool. And what's, what's got your interest at the moment? What have you been hacking on? Uh, uh, I've been doing quite a bit of stuff on Striplog this last week. Um, trying to get some, trying to improve the I.O. Um, a bit. Uh, so we'll see that seems to be going. Um, that'll be nice. Um, also, the digital geology or the you know Python for geologists course that we um, that Rob mentioned. Um, that's been interesting to put some stuff together there. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll that sh that should be a good one once we go live yeah. with it. It's a good, you know, I did a very early version of that four or five years ago when I joined the software underground. So excited to see that get an up update. And finally, before you uh, get on with your presentation, one random fact. Um, everybody needs a debugging duck. 
um, you can then talk to your debugging duck and you know solve many more problems than if you don't have a debugging duck to talk to. Great. Okay, with that, the floor is yours for the next five minutes, and I will see you at the end. All right. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about... Um, uh, it was a last-minute thought regarding possible hackathon um, project, uh, which unfortunately ended up not really getting too much traction this time around. Um, is that screen still sharing properly? Um, Yes. OK, um, so if you start QGIS, one of the things that they've got in their docs, is, if you start doing stuff with QGIS, is that they've got this QGIS training manual, uh, which goes through a whole bunch of stuff, you know, creating new data, um, how to use a print layout, and all of that. And towards the end, once you've done a bunch of useful things on sort of like base level, they have this module 14 here, which is forestry application. And the idea behind it is just, you know, you take all the stuff that you've done in the first 13 chapters or the first 13 modules, and now you start actually using that on some real, albeit probably slightly simplified data, um, and, you know, use some of the skills you've learned and see how it might apply. Um, and I think this would be a really nice thing to have a geoscience version of as well, um, whether that is part of the you know, QGIS training manual proper, or if Swung hosts it and just, you know, forks it and rips out the forestry and puts in a geoscience one. Um, I, I think that would probably be worth it. It's not doing anything particularly complex. So the main thing here would just be to find some reasonable sample data. Um, so in this case, it's, um, you know, coming from, from Finland, but, you know, it'd be cool to find somewhere. Speaking to some people, they suggested um, possibly New Zealand has some decent data that would be available. Um, and then just look at, you know, some simple things that you might want to do. So here they've got georeferencing. Um, so, you know, you can georeference your, georeference a field map or something, if we can find or make one. Um, then start actually digitizing these digitize this map so you end up with a digital geological map rather than just the paper one. Um, look at what else we could do. So here they're updating forest stands. Maybe we don't necessarily need to do that, but, you know, pull in some aerial photographs and do some additional processing on that. Um, they've got some sampling designs here. Um, so this is obviously for with forestry in mind, and maybe this is where we start to diverge and do do things that are more geological or subsurface, possibly. Um, you know, we could quite easily put another another layer or so underneath here of, you know, this is a two-way travel time at a particular depth. And, you know, we now have a time a, a time depth there that we can, and you know, look at how that looks on the surface and then look at if you can follow these structures down below this, down below or something. Um, and I think this might be potentially useful um so that's something i want to look at doing um do a bit of hacking on that but yeah, if people are interested um i would welcome some additional help on this one um but yeah i think that's pretty much all that i have to say at the moment um, but yeah thank you for the platform yeah you've got a got a minute and a half left if you'd like to plug anything give anyone a shout out or uh, no not text, really just uh, yeah, is no, there just anything, the, anything in T21? No, just that, uh, uh, for T21. Oh, if people haven't seen it, um, I think um, Steve's tutorial from today was a really good one to go back and look at, um, sort of introduction to Git and GitHub. Um, so if you're feeling a little bit like, you know, sort of what's going on, but not enough, um, there's some really nice stuff there. I thought that was quite a good one. Um, albeit not subsurface, but, um, you know, general collaboration and or collaboration tools and similar things like that, which I think are, are worthwhile. But, yeah. The inversion control for geoscientists is uh, something very important, I think. Yeah. I think it should be on the agenda of every, every transform. Because, uh, <laughs> we're, we're not, I know I'm, I'm as guilty as the next guy about 
not being as good as, good as it should be. But thanks for jumping in. I know you're on the later additions to the schedule. Um, yeah. yeah, follow up on the, the mentioned ideas if you're interested. You know, there's, uh, and I would remind people there's time to hack outside of these uh, organized events. You know, I, I do a lot of weekend coding or hobby coding projects, but thanks again, Martin. Um, and we are just at the end of your time now, so we can move back to the scheduled TV as it were. So yes, if, if the lightning talks have sparked any ideas for you, do uh, do uh, find time to uh, find time to um, do these things and connect with people on the software underground. So I'm stuck struggling with my words a little bit. So I'm going to have to grab some water inside the next talk. But next up is a returning speaker from last year. Again, it's Arthur. So if you want to step up to the stage, uh, come off mute and share the camera, and we can get the ball rolling. Hi, everyone. Uh, is my audio working OK this year? Yeah, you are coming through much clearer than last year. It's nice oh, to see great. you again. That's great to hear. I'll probably never try again to use some uh, local network stuff during a live demo. Let's see how it yeah. goes this time. Fingers crossed. So. How long have you been with the Software Underground now, Arthur? Is it well? Uh, how long was has it been since the last transform? Was it on June or July last year? It has been ten months since the last transform. I was looking at the vods earlier. So it's been ten months since I've been a member of uh, Swunk. Great. And um, what are you working on this year in transform? Are you hacking? Are you teaching? Are you learning? Or a bit of everything? Well, I'm actually finally working as a geologist ever since uh, January. I started working in a junior company look, uh, searching gold in northeastern Brazil. So there's that. And mostly as a data, uh, data scientist. I also have a lot of uh, different projects that I still have to finish. But time is not helping me much. Yeah, I think we're all, we've all got what I call projects, projects with ambitions at the moment. Lots of things to finish and too much time yeah, to finish them. Definitely. All right. So before I hand you hand the stage over to you, my last question is, what is one random fact you want the software underground to know? Huh. Yeah, I also forgot that you were going to ask this question. And I already told the fact that I'm now a geologist. A practice in geologist. Uh, well, I think that a random fact is that even though most of my presentations are in JavaScript, two out of two now, I mostly program in Python. And JavaScript is uh, side stuff that I like to learn. Great. Uh, so with that, the stage is yours for the next five minutes, and I will yeah. see you at the end. Okay, I found the share screen button. Let's see. Can you tell me if the screen is appearing? Yeah, forward modeling in JavaScript. Okay, well, uh, I didn't have uh, that. I had some different projects that I wanted to present during this transform lightning talk, but as time uh, passed by and I couldn't really decide on which one, I decided to go with one with, which is a somewhat of a continuation of a pretty old project, which is ECMO team. It's a simple forward modeling, uh, geological forward modeling uh, page uh, written mostly in JavaScript. It has been inspired mostly in OpenSCAD uh, with this idea of having a source code for whatever you were modeling on the left and then seeing the results of what you've written on the right and fully 3d and also visible geology for the idea of having a geological model in the browser and naughty as well uh, originally this was a python project called malt which i started developing in I think something like nine years ago and um, Worked on uh, sometimes uh, works. Sorry, on and off on it. Uh, 
as the years passed. And then last year, I decided to port it to JavaScript. It took because I was using some kind of annoying to install libraries in Python to use it. Though the JavaScript version is not fully paired with the original Python version. Anyway, uh, the basic idea of Mout is to have uh, a couple of functions or objects inside a model object that follow this simple structure. So uh, you have to provide functions that get x and v bin x, the position vector or whichever voxel is being modeled, modeled right now. Then you do anything you want with both x and v and return them. X represents, as I said, the position of the voxel, and V is the lithology code, or, well, for now it's a lithology code, but it could be anything in the future. Uh, having said that, it's mostly Code Mirror and 3.js doing the, the heavy lifting. Heavy lifting. Uh, 3.js has some really neat uh, 3D vector manipulation uh, capabilities, so it made it even simpler to implement than the Python version. And the Python version is quite simple uh, because, well, it's, there's not that much implemented for now. We have planar surfaces for uh, erosions and uh, depositions and stuff. We have faults, so normal, oblique, uh, and reverse, and whatever you want. Uh, sinusoidal faults, which you can overlay, again, however you want. And topography, but that is not uh, that's still not on the live page, that's only on my computer, uh, which works by loading a geotiff. And while well, time is passing, for the future, I, I intend to implement abstract syntax tree analysis for object extraction, new structures, an interface for inspecting and changing object properties that were de that detected with the AST analysis, uh, important data like boreholes and such and stochastic analysis for varying properties, which is somewhat implemented in Python. And now we can go for a live demo. Let's hope that this doesn't break. Uh, this presentation was made as a comment in the code. So if anyone worked with OpenSCAD before, this kind of copies it uh, wholeheartedly. We define some points. And using these points, we can create uh, faults. Uh, I have to make documentation for this, but the fault receives a point, uh, an orientation, and uh, a normal vector, sorry, and a, a displacement orientation vector. Uh, I, it's all JavaScript, right? So you can use anything that's available for that, uh, like mapping something to view the lithology uh, list. And folds, it's pretty similar. And in the model, I just uh, overlay everything. So then I build this whole uh, 3D array of data. And then uh, I inspect it with a pretty simple custom shader uh, in 3JS that just uh, take what's whatever is inside it so it can be pretty fast. Uh, we could, for example, Remove the faults, rerun, and then we have just the, some faulting in it. Uh, and I think that's my time, unfortunately. Yep, that is exactly right. So if you'd like to see more, please do grab Arthur and uh, in the chateau or over the next couple of days. Maybe next transform we'll have another tutorial uh, on this. If, it's, if it will be ready, but thanks for stepping yeah. up and giving a presentation. If you'd like a little bit longer, I am next. So if you want to finish the, the little demonstration, I don't mind giving you a couple of uh, my spare minutes. Well, there's not that much to present for now. Uh, it's uh, pretty basic. The Python version, which uses, uh, I don't know if it's been still being developed, and I hope I don't offend anyone from Intel here, but uh, Trades UI to build it. And it got kind of annoying to run Trade CY nowadays. I'm not sure if it's just me, but uh, in hindsight, I should have used uh, PyQt or PySci directly in, instead of it. But yeah, that's it. Uh, and I uh, today, finally, I'll be on the Chateau in the afternoon to meet all you guys again so we can talk then.
So I don't intend to steal any of your minutes. Great. Well, thanks uh, for presenting and thanks for being on time. Um, and uh, was my sound for okay this time? It was perfect. I think uh, everyone could hear you well. The uh, demo worked live, so we've come leaps and bounds from the previous transform. Thanks. Uh, see you later. Great. Thanks. So yes, next up uh, is myself, Dan, and I'm going to talk about a little project that started on the back of a napkin a few years ago and I've been playing around with in, in my spare time. I don't have too many slides, uh, so I may well jump around a bit on some other transform stuff. As I previously mentioned, I've been in the software underground since 2018, maybe earlier. I attended a hackathon um, that was attached to Petex, and I met Matt, Steve, Rob, and a lot of people there. Um, we were working on a project called Mystic Bit, where we created a or attempted to make a tool that could predict ahead of the drill bit using machine learning, and it was really cool. Great mix of guys. Uh, I learned to code there as well for the first time. At the moment, um, I'm working on a lot of stuff with time series data. Uh, people who may have seen me around know I like, I'm a biostratigrapher by training. So I'm uh, hacking on, um, yes, Lucas, my random fact will be coming soon, don't worry. Um, I've been hacking around stuff with Biostrat uh, for a while, image segmentation and recognition and some missing speciation stuff. Uh, it's not what I'm going to talk about today. And as Lucas rightly has reminded me about uh, submitting a random fact, I have one, I have several actually. One is I've driven a Formula One car uh, around Silverstone. Two is that I won this, uh, the NVIDIA broadcast is pixelating it a bit, but I won this piece of core from my very first hackathon run by Matt, and it now sits on my wall in my brand new apartment. It's from the Talbot Formation in the North Sea, uh, and it is Middle Jurassic Brent Group. So there we go. I hope those were random enough for you, Lucas. I do have more. My brain is a repository of random knowledge. But for now, I am going to present what I've nicknamed Project BIM, which I just need to find the slides for. And naturally, I'll probably be the one who goes over time. So share my screen. View. So hopefully you can see uh, my, my little fetching title slide. For those of you familiar with James May's Our Man in Japan, uh, he had a little robot companion called BIM. And BIM in this case stands for Bayesian Inference Machine. So it's a little little joke from me to me here. But uh, we should probably start the timer as well. It's a good question, York, but who does watch The Watchmen? It's me all the time. So now Steve will probably recognize uh, this little scribble for generative surface models. It was an idea from him of getting good, accurate priors using Bayesian methods to turn said priors into models that could be then used to predict properties. And it was really an idea to tackle synthetic well data for training or validation or exploratory data analysis, which are some of my, some of my favorite things to do with the tools we have at hand with big data and machine learning. And Steve sketched this out. We had a bit of a brainstorm. Um, Lucas. Um, who is also floating around at the time was working on some stuff in PyTorch using distributions in PyTorch. Uh, he was recreating the Raff and Tarantola work. So I figured I would um, follow, follow that up and see if we could use the PyTorch distribution tools to sample from known well tops and try and build formations. And then from there, you could maybe create actual physical properties and finally create a nice synthetic seismogram at the end. So it was a very ambitious back of a napkin. Um, also, it's impressive how clean Steve can, Steve's handwriting can be on a napkin. Uh, this is what we turned it into as a bit of a whiteboard at the time, uh, looking for data, looking for ways we can do it, uh, how to visualize it, and how to present it. Um, basically, it was a 
structured hackathon at the time uh, that went into went into production into some Jupyter notebooks, uh, which I have, but they're not really in a shareable state at the moment, unfortunately. I did have the ambition of tidying this all up and putting it out as a hackathon topic ahead of Transform, but time got away from me. But how far did we get is, is a good question. So we did get through cleaning the worlds, which took significantly longer, and getting geologically accurate stacks. One of the problems was unconformities and what in Bayesian statistics is called the hidden species problem. If formations one through 10 are in well one, should they all be in well two? Is there a formation 11 and 12? And that was pretty tough um, because basically we only had the thicknesses of the formations and cultural data to estimate that from. But eventually by taking this code that Lucas had written, the created fake uh, layered models and using that and drawing from a known stratigraphic column, I was able to produce these kind of pseudo realistic stratigraphies and this rather unfetching plot which i'll probably get crucified for the color scheme it is where this project is we could able to say okay here's my stratigraphic column i can sample known distributions using pytorch i can choose the type of distribution whether it's uniform not uniform gaussian dish trichelet etc and i can build fake stratigraphies the next step here is then to layer that and say, do this a thousand times and produce me a big, you know, Monte Carlo style model of all of these things. And from there, try and connect it to the expected wireline properties. Uh, biggest, toughest loop as well was visualizing the data in a meaningful way. It was very easy to get lots of nice statistical plots, but to visualize it in a way that um, made sense to a geologist was tough. And if anyone can answer how I can get my little array here into a strip log or something a bit better than taking it out and putting it to there, I would appreciate that because this is just a print out of the results of the function for now. So this really stretched me to the limits of what I could do in Python and I did get to learn some new stuff. Um, I usually do a lot of stuff on the munging side and not so much on this. So it was a good fun experiment. And I threw these slides together just now to kind of fill the gap in the presentations. So hopefully people have enjoyed seeing my little world of BIM. Um, I'll, I'll put, probably put myself on the line here and say by Transform next year, I'll have something much better than this to share with the world. So thanks guys for listening and thanks everyone for attending the lightning talks. It's always a fun thing to do um, as the chair. It's really fun because we don't ask for the topics in advance. We don't ask. We don't do a lot of QC, there's no abstracts, there's nothing. It's what do you want to talk about for five minutes or in 300 seconds? And it's great to see variety and people talking about the unexpected. So I love it, man. That's why I volunteered to do them. And with that, my time is over. So thank you, everyone. And if you want to avoid seeing me uh, present hastily prepared slides every year, please do sign up for. Uh, Presenting lightning talks. I think there are still slots available tomorrow. Um, there is one slot today after our next speaker if someone has a burning desire to round it off. Otherwise, I think Matt and myself will do a little wrap up for 10 minutes. But uh, yeah, and with that, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Alessandro, to the stage. If you'd like to come off mute and, and share your face with the world. I think you're still muted. Uh, it, we don't have your microphone. Getting some very, <clears throat> very loud static, but no, uh, no microphone. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Sorry. Um, hi, hi, Dan. How are you? It's, I'm good. It's nice to, nice to speak to you again. Yes, yes. It's been a while. So I've been on Swang since the beginning, I think. It must be August 2015. That's the first question that I was prepared to answer. Great. And uh, what have you been working on at Transform this week, if you've been yeah, able to I, catch it? No, I, I haven't been able to follow 
and anything. I just uh, um, booked uh, almost all the tutorials to um, to follow them as soon as I can. Yeah. Cool. And I, I know you're a keen keen sportsman. Is your random fact uh, around sports, or do you have mm. something else in mind? Yes, well, I, I, I wanted to, to share something about the mountaineering, but then you said that you, you've driven an F1 car. So I guess uh, nobody knows that uh, uh, once upon a time I used to race motorbikes and I started in the UK when I was living in, in the UK. So I have very fond me me memories of uh, Cadwell Park and Snetterton and uh, Malady Park, etc. That's the one fact. Awesome. Yeah. No, my dad. Um, my dad was uh, big into motorsports, and his boss used to used to uh, his son used to be a professional driver. So I was lucky enough to get to try one of the backup cars for for them. So with that, the floor is yours for the next five minutes, and I will join you at the end. Okay. So um, let me start here. Yes, so uh, this is uh, like a, a little investigation on the uh, AVO class four. So I'll, I'll have to pretend that uh, everybody knows about AVO, which is uh, you know amplitude versus offsets, and it's one, one of the historical technologies available to explorationists. Um, and I, I had uh, uh, these uh, examples uh, just to, to make the, the point that uh, the same subsurface structure is seen differently by near and far and far angle stacks. And these um, AVO classes are simply a, a shortcut to describe how amplitude change with different angles of uh, incidence. Uh, so, for example, in, in this case here, if we take uh, you know just the, the same point on um, you know we we have to imagine that, that this is a, a a an interface separating uh, for example shades above from sands below okay so if we take these uh, point along the interface separating the 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 two rocks um first on near and then on far and then we plot them let's say this is the zero line upwards is a positive amplitude and then we have a negative amplitude so this near value here that is a negative but not so much this amplitude here on far is negative is a more more negative and uh, this is a uh, you know, a short. This is a class three, so it's it's a shortcut to describe how this uh, um, a, a certain assemblage of uh, of rocks uh, um, is a uh, is seen by near and far and far angle stacks. And the AVO class four is simply is similar, but uh, you know, we take the same kind of a uh, um, point zero plus minus and we see that on near we have a, a stronger negative amplitude than on far and so this is a class four it's really irrelevant but i wanted to use my my pencil uh, and uh, and draw on top of these slides um so i, I have collected uh, all these uh, numbers the the, the various re reference va values for bp vs and density for all the, the various combinations of works that are taken as examples for the four ADO classes. Um, I put them as a, as a day, day, data frames, and, and you see that the, for class four, I don't have pro, pro, porosity. What's the pro, 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 porosity for class four? So to get porosity, we can uh, use a the densities, this is the, the formula. I won't go into the details, but I'll just uh, show, you know, the little function that I, that I have um, put together. And, uh, you know, for all the AVO classes, uh, 
one, two, three, and four. For the first three, we have a, a, a given value and a calculated value. So we see that uh, these are all okay you now. So uh, the, this means that the, the pro procedure is sound. So uh, for class four, we can uh, we are be, be between 25 and 27 percent okay so we just assign to uh, these um avo class four that are you know for the vpds and density that i that i took from 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 literature i'll assign a positive of, of 26 percent um and that's what we have here we have filled now for porosities uh, also for class four. There's a, an, another way to calculate porosities, not using densities, but using, you know, based on, on Gassman's equation, which is the, 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 the building block for fluid replacement. And uh, again, I won't go in, into the, the details, but again, for, for class three, you know, the calculated and given are almost the same. So the, the method is okay. But for class four, what I get is a 16%. You see here, 16. While the porosities that I had from, from density was 26%. So something must be off. And uh, I know that I've already got the five minutes mark, but may, maybe I just need a, another minute or so. And um, right, this is, a, I had a, a nice little this tool here, but... Uh, of course, I didn't. Um, ah, that's that's too bad. I didn't recalculate the 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 notebook. But uh, let, let, let me just show you here without going into. Um, oh, maybe I can do this. Yeah. Let's see if we go. Yes. So I, I had also built this little tool that shows uh, basically the the a the graphical uh, view of using Gassman's equation. So you see where these two lines intersect, then uh, this is the porosities for uh, that is cal calculated via via Gassman's equation. For class four, this is way off. This is sixteen percent is what. Uh, Gazman is giving us, but uh, this is too different from the value that I get using the density equation. So, what's the problem? Is that uh, you know the the question is uh, is it real, realistic for the sixteen percent uh, sand uh, for the sixteen percent porosity sand to increase its uh, velocities of almost 60 percent going from gas to wine taking into, into consideration that class 3 sand with a much higher porosity shows only a 40 percent increase so if gasman doesn't work um, i guess one of the inputs so vpvs or density must be wrong um i also built an, another little tool to to investigate the uh, the reliability, the validity of VPDS and density uh, via rock physics mo modeling, but I guess there's no time to, to do that. I'll just click randomly on these uh, uh, sliders here. And I skip to the conclusions where I, I just wonder if uh, John Castagna, who was the author of, of, of the the papers where the uh, um, class four was uh, introduced. Uh, is he really sure about the, those numbers? And finally, you know, maybe class four ABO is only peculiar because of what's above, uh, you know? So I'll just take a class three sun, I'll put a class four shell on top, and still you get something that plots in a, in a class four quadrant right so and that's the end of it i'm sorry if i've gone over time that's okay the advantage of being the last speaker is there is a bit of time left but it's, it's a nice very clean notebook yeah compared to my notebooks it's uh heads, heads and shoulders above thanks for, right. thanks for making the time and i hope you managed to catch up with the tutorials and what have you that have been going on i know there's a lot to digest and 
Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank Good. you. And Thanks goodbye. Cool. Well, that brings us to the end of our scheduled programming for the day. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to jump on and join me for a quick, quick wrap up of the of what we've seen today and what what's coming tomorrow. Maybe a few words on what we can expect from tomorrow. I see you're uh, you're in the bright yellow shirt. Um, is this yeah. a Phil Camp plug? That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't actually have anything to say. I think we can we can let people go if. Um, you know, every, once everybody knows that we're doing the same thing tomorrow, same time, same place. We've got uh, actually a full or almost full schedule, I think, tomorrow uh, of the lightning talks. Um, the Friday slots were a bit more popular uh, for whatever reason. So, yeah, looking forward to those. Yep, that's, it's it's going to be good. Similar format. Uh, same. So prepare your random questions. I'd just like to thank all our speakers and everyone in the chat, guys on YouTube and anyone who's watching this on Catch Up as well. Like yeah. I say, these are always fun because we they're a journey of discovery for everyone in the audience and everyone in, in the panel of two here. But um, it's great to be involved. And it's, you know, it's Transform is, is always great. It's, anyone who's interested, do go for a lightning talk because they're, they're a very easy way to get in and get buy-in. And don't forget to speak to our speakers in the Chateau, Slack channels and everywhere else. And don't forget to buy merch. <laughs> That's right. Softwareunderground.org slash shop. Discount code yeah. transform. No, there's no discount code. Nice try, buddy. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Matt. And thanks, right. everyone. I will see you tomorrow for the lightning talks. I will be floating around Slack. I probably won't be on the Chateau, but yeah, feel free to reach out if you want to know more. See you soon. Bye.